And um, bear with me when I show you the operative findings. So the common theme and the reason I'm showing these two is that in part anyway, we have a new uh, cardiothoracic surgeon and he's doing vascular procedures that um, are different from what I'm used to. And I'll show you one in a moment that I've never seen before. So I'm going to um, emphasize kind of two things. One is, let me just get back to what I was showing. Can you still hear and see me? I, you guys I can, can I, hear let's see, I can hear you. Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. So that um, two important things. One is I find it um, very, very helpful to, when interpreting post-operative images in particular in patients that have had these vascular procedures, to have the operative findings so I can understand what I'm seeing, particularly as you'll see when you have a new surgeon and he does different things. So you'll see how that plays out. So let me just start with this one case over here. And as I go along, I'll give you some background, but I'm actually going to put up alongside it and keep alongside it a relatively long list of um, information. So the background here is here, going back to 914 on the left hand side, you'll see there's a history of surgically managed aortic dissection. And there is a, a interposition graft in the ascending aorta. You can see that there is still a false lumen that contains some contrast opacified blood during the procedure. Now I'll go forward in time to more recently, which is January of 2017 and you'll see the same findings. Um, a large false lumen, there is some passage of contrast to pacified blood into it, but you'll see also that there is dilatation quite substantial of the aortic root in addition. So they decided that they were going to do a replacement of the root as well as the ascending aorta and do a hemi-arch as well as what the surgeon likes to deal with is the descending aorta as well. So the first thing they did, and you'll see how that plays out in a moment, um, is that as you can see on the right-hand side, was the first thing they did was they basically, and I'll show you the follow-up here from a little bit later, sort of in preparation for that, they did a, carotid to subclavian bypass, and you can see the graft going from carotid to subclavian. And they also basically put a plug in the proximal subclavian artery. And they dealt with a false channel here in the subclavian artery, so call that part one. And you can see a description of that on the right-hand side. Then what they next did was a procedure where they dealt with the aortic root and the ascending aorta. So they basically, and I'll show you that in a moment, um, did a root and ascending aorta replacement as well as an elephant trunk procedure in the second operation. So I'll just bring this up just to remind people, and it's much easier to actually see the elephant trunk procedure rather than describe it because it's kind of hard to understand if you just describe it but i'll show you that in a moment but basically to do the elephant trunk procedure at the same time you take a graft and you create basically an elephant trunk that is here in the purple that goes down the proximal descending aorta they pull out the proximal portion of this graft as you can see they fashion that and they use that as part of the operation for the aortic arch. So basically that's what they did for procedure number two. And you can see for the aortic root, they used a Valsalva prosthesis and you can see they also used this perimount aortic valve. So let me go forward in time here now to show you what that looks like on a follow-up exam that goes along with that. So let me go here and 
uh, very quickly just go from here up. Here we see the aortic valve bioprosthesis. And of course, it's connected to the Valsalva graft. And then when you scroll through that, it can get very confusing. But if you have the operative record, which I had, then I was able to determine that two things. One, this is a distal anastomosis here, which is reinforced with felt right there. And this, in this particular patient, is the appearance of the elephant trunk. And I'm not quite sure why, but it's a little bit redundant, a little bit floppy, as it were. But that is the elephant trunk portion of the procedure. And then, of course, you ask, why did they basically deal with the left subclavian artery in that fashion? Well, I think the surgeon decided that when doing this hemi-arch replacement and placement of the elephant trunk, that it would be easier for him to make the anastomosis just between the left carotid car car artery and the occluded left subclavian artery, as you can see from this anastomosis. I'm not quite sure why but that's what he decided to do. And as you can see over here, he said, um, that's what he did. And, and he said, I was able to perform the distal anastomosis, which greatly facilitated my aortic reconstruction because of that prior procedure involving the subclavian artery, which was occluded right there with the plug. So that kind of explained the appearance of this whole thing. So at this point in time, he's had replacement of the aortic root. He's got replacement of the aortic arch or hemi-arch and he's got the elephant trunk. Then to continue the saga, what they kind of planned over time was they followed for the patient for a period of time, but over time they still had flow in the false lumen. So then they decided to continue with what they originally planned. Sorry, this gets complicated, which was to use the elephant trunk as the proximal landing zone for an endovascular stent. And you can see here on July 18 was the procedure in which they used two grafts and they put the two grafts in the descending aorta. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like on the follow-up. I'll show you on the coronal image. Now the patient has these stent grafts in the descending aorta, proximal landing zone is in the elephant trunk. Hence they use the elephant trunk for this procedure. And there was a description of how they identified the intercostal artery, which they were worried about, which I couldn't find, and the celiac, which they didn't want to acute, obviously, with the stent. So here is the most recent exam where we have like part three or part four. And when you evaluate that, and it's important now to tell them where the stent grafts are, but also the state of the false lumen. So here we still have the false lumen. And I'm not telling you everything because this gets really complicated. But suffice it to say that, unfortunately, when they evaluated the stent graft all the way down, it looked fine and fine until we got to a point right here where we identified two places where there is contrast or pacification into the false lumen, which is a little bit unfortunate. And I think the one site right here is coming from an intercostal but unfortunately, this stain graft was just a little bit short of one place where there is a communication between true lumen and false lumen. So if that had been just a little bit longer, it would have taken care of that. So now he's still in a situation where there's potentially still some contrast of pacification of the, the distal descending aorta, and whether they'll do anything about that beyond following that up, I don't really know. So it's kind of a complicated case, but there's so many findings. But in terms of reporting all these things, unless you have some insight into what they did, I think it would be really hard to uh, report an exam like this, particularly if you have lots of follow-ups and have an idea of what they're looking for at any one point in time in the postoperative situation. I any question have... about that or any observations about that? Can you, uh, can you help me with this elephant trunk business? The internal thing that they then pull upward is native aorta or is that uh, a graft within a graft? Yeah, the thing that they pull upward, if I go back to this diagram over here, is graft. So the thing that they pull upward, which is here where this arrow is, is what they use for reconstructing the aortic arching part. And here you can see in this particular diagram, 
they have um, have an island of tissue and they've got three vessels that they're connecting here. In this particular patient, they only had to connect to this, to the graft, two vessels, the left common carotid and the nominate artery, because they had in this patient dealt with the subclavian separately with the supraclavicular bypass. Right. But the, the elephant trunk portion is the that redundant portion of graft that's in the yes. proximal descending aorta that they use yes. as the landing zone for this. So it's all part of the same graft and then they just leave a redundant yes. portion that yes. then can be covered, that, that they insert the stent into. So that's the point of the stage procedure is it gives yes. them their, a, a landing zone for the stent. Or an, another procedure which could be a stent. I mean, or, you can also... Right, um, right. It's for the yeah. It used to be an open procedure, but now it's almost always, you know, done as a stent in the descending aorta. Right. So the idea again, just to go back, which I didn't mention, the whole concept of the elephant trunk procedure is that if you're dealing with one thing, for example, in this case, the ascending aorta, you can't operate and deal with the descending aorta through a sternal incision. So the second procedure has to be done subsequently or separately because you can't do both procedures through a single sternal incision. So the elephant trunk facilitates a subsequent procedure, right? Okay, so let me show you an, another thing which I had never heard of before. So to go back to the notion of dealing with aortic pathology that involves the ascending aorta, and the descending aorta or involving the ascending aorta and potentially the descending aorta, you have this concept of the elephant trunk procedure. And initially, I think it was used to deal with aneurysms involving both portions of the aorta, for example, where you would do a stage procedure. But the question is, in part, what do you do when you have, like in this case, an aortic dissection? So here we start off with a very typical type A aortic dissection involving ascending aorta and descending aorta. And part of the impetus for what I'm going to show you next <clears throat> is the notion that the proximal descending aorta, which you typically potentially just leave when you operate in a patient with a type A dissection, is a potential problem going forward. And it's always been a quandary as to how you deal with problems that subsequently arise in the false lumen in the descending aorta, for example, in the case of a type A dissection. So someone had the idea, what about the possibility of dealing with both simultaneously? So you operate in the patient and you do a surgical procedure for the ascending aorta, and then to try to forestall issues related to the descending aorta, particularly the proximal descending aorta, the idea is that you do a technique called a frozen elephant trunk technique. And you can see a description right there. So what you do is through the same incision at the same operation, you deal with the ascending aorta and the aortic arch in an appropriate fashion. And then during the same operation, you put in an endovascular stent graft into the distal aortic arch and proximal descending aorta at the same operation. So I'll show you that now. So this is a pretty typical type A dissection and you see the true and false lumens and so on and so forth. Now I'm gonna show you images obtained relatively soon after the operation. And it's going to look like this. And then we'll see what they did. So in terms of the operation here, you know, it's really fairly complicated but you're gonna do two things. You're gonna deal with the ascending aorta, aortic arch, as well as this frozen elephant trunk, which is a synthetic graft. So I'm gonna describe to you fairly quickly what they did. So you can see over here that we've got a stent in the distal aortic arch and proximal descending aorta. And the stent is associated with an anastomosis to a graft right here, which is reinforced with felt. And then if we go to the aorta lower down, you can see this proximal anastomosis associated with felt also. Now this fluid collection 
turned out to be something that the surgeon wasn't that concerned about. Now I'm going to just go back just to show you the comparison with the previous one. So sorry, let me bring that over here if it, I can do that. Pre-op right there. And that shouldn't be thinking, sorry about that. Let me just go back to here and let me put the post up um, up here. Okay, so at this point in time, we have um, a finding that initially I was perplexed about. So when I started looking at the ascending aorta on this post-op image, I really wondered about what this was right there. And in looking at the pre op image and seeing what they'd done, we decided that this right there was just a remnant portion of the false lumen um, near the root of the aorta and was not a new finding. Similarly, this right there is a remnant portion of the false lumen finding, not a new pseudoaneurysm, but just a remnant portion um, below the level of this anastomosis right there. And then we go forward, everything looks okay. And then the reason we have this particular stent there goes back to how this particular surgeon did this procedure. So then we go back there and we see that when he put in this graft, this frozen elephant trunk, you can see that he had to do two things. One, he had to actually incise the graft to make sure that the left common carotid artery was perfused. And for the subclavian artery, he had to put in this short stent to keep it open. So knowing what he did, I could then understand that. And I could also at least report that the left com common carotid artery is patent. Because as you can see over here, he had to incise the graft to make a fenestration. He said he cut a small scallop out of the fabric of the graft at the location of the left common carotid artery. So once you have that information, it kind of makes sense. Although I've never seen a frozen elephant trunk before, but that refers to this graft that we see in the distal aortic arch. Now they hope over time that this false lumen will not get any bigger. And I think the contrast we see in it is coming from below upwards. And anyhow, that explains the whole concept. So if you want to read more about the so-called frozen elephant trunk technique, where it's used, why it's used. Here's a nice article that uh, you can read about that and they describe how it's used and, and so on and so forth. And this is the first one that I've ever seen and didn't know how to report sort of until I learned about it and understood what they were trying to do, what they did. What does frozen so I, mean in this context? I don't know why, I think, I don't know why they use the term frozen, maybe because it's a prosthetic thing. It's a stain graft rather than a, a yeah, I don't know. Actually, I don't know why the term frozen elephant trunk. That I don't understand. Yeah. Has anyone seen this frozen trunk technique before? Nope. This is the first one. Yeah, it's the first one. So again, part of the part of the reason that they do this is to try to forestall problems that may arise in the proximal descending aorta particularly if you think there may be an entry site in the proximal descending aorta, as you can see here. And it's my first one that I've ever seen. Alrighty, those All right. are my two cases. Sorry they were so uh, prolonged. No, very complicated, but thanks for the detailed discussion. I like the diagrams too. Alrighty, David or Travis? I have, I have one case. <clears throat> All right. So um, this fellow has a documented genetic abnormality that has resulted in um, a couple of lung cysts. So here's the only cyst I can find at this moment. I think there was one on the right as well. So he's got this little um, sort of paraseptal lung cyst. So it turns out that he has a folliculin mutation, and this is bird hog debay. Um, and then he has another interesting uh, study. So let me, I have to go back to this, I think. Let me show you his um, 
PET scan a few months ago at an outside hospital because he's got this issue over here, which turns out to be a soft tissue sarcoma. So on the coronal imaging, you can see this thing as well. So this was treated, it was resected, I think chemotherapized and radiotherapized as well. So, you know, the people with Berthog de Bay have a problem with some tumor suppression, and I'm used to renal tumors in this case, which he didn't have, but this is the first soft tissue sarcoma I've seen, and I believe that this is probably associated. I haven't read about the other sarcomas that could occur with Berthog de Bay, but I think this is probably all part of the same syndrome. So uh, at this point, I haven't had a chance to read about this case very much. <clears throat> I think this is a, um, a sarcoma associated with his Berthog de Bay. Mm. Have you seen weird tumors with BHD or just the conventional renal tumors? Well, it's a tumor suppressor gene, so you can get other tumors. I haven't personally seen them, and I don't know what the list includes. Yeah, so do a Google to follow, and I will uh, let you know what I find. Yeah, my understanding is besides kidney tumors, I think they're at increased risk of colon cancer. But mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know about sarcomas. That's one I'm not familiar with. But I, I think I read somewhere one time about um, colon cancer. Got it. Okay. Well, I'll try to have more information when I post this case. Okay. That's the only case I had a chance to um, to load up today, but I've got some others looking for this. He had, so he only had a few cysts. Did he have skin findings that you know of or family history? Have, yeah, I haven't gotten that far, Jeff. I just okay. um, this case yesterday. And okay. So, you know. Okay. All right. Thanks, David. Travis, you ready to go? Sure. I'm at the VA, so I'm not sure how good my connection will be, but I'll show you a couple cases. This is one I actually saw this morning. This is a patient who's 72, and I came into the VA this morning, and he was teed up to do a lung biopsy. He's a patient that has a history of heart failure, has AFib has been on anticoagulation, or at least reportedly on anticoagulation, and had this CT a few days ago. And so this was dubbed as a combination of pneumonia in the left lower lobe and then two nodules here, one in the right lower lobe and one in the left in the lingula. And so of course, there was some suspicion of this being cancer and maybe this being cancer. And it was either pneumonia or, or the question had been raised by others of whether or not this could all be then lymph engine thick spread with a malignant effusion. But I took a look at this this morning, especially when you look at it on the soft tissue windows, you can see that there's this rim of higher attenuation, and this is very much confined to the posterior basal segment. And it, what's interesting too is in here, it looks like this artery, or at least something is expanded and getting, Digging into his history a little bit more, I talked to the clinicians, and turns out that he would have homoptosis. Really have signs or symptoms, and so I was willing to bet quite a bit of money that this was going to be an infarct in this area. And so, as as I always said, it would look like an orange with the rind, and I and I will credit David as he was the one that said this should be the blood orange sign since it's hemorrhagic. Uh, but instead of having them do a CT guided biopsy, I had them put them on the table, and we did a CT with contrast. And sure enough, you can see this morning, this was just a couple of hours ago, he has a huge PE, and this is all hemorrhagic infarction in the posterior basal segment of the left lower lobe. And it's a nice contrast here to the to the atelectasis as well in that left lower lobe. And so you can get exudative effusions in about a third of patients that have infarcts. I think this is probably also a small little infarct as there's a little PE going into this branch, into the inferior segment of the lingula. So the, probably is what, what that, that is. Now, now the jury is still out on this thing over here, whether it's a cancer or not, but he couldn't even hold his breath for the two seconds it took to acquire this exam. So we'll wait on that. This non-contra appearance that we see now, in history, I think this is 
more than just trabeculation in his right atrial appendage. So whether he had thrombus embolism from a lower extremity vein, or whether he had also has a big thrombus in his left atrial appendage. So non-contrast in part with, here's another example that I had with my little blood orange that I can slide with that, that rind of high attenuation and then the lower, the pulp in the middle. And I think as we've all, and I think Jeff is the one that's mentioned this and you know, usually you don't see air bronchograms in these, in these areas of infarct either. So. Yeah. And, and I don't know why that. Always remember infarcts. Yeah. I, I've tried to figure out why you don't see air bronchograms. Um, I guess maybe the airway walls are just so edematous. You don't see a contrast between the lumen and the wall. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But there, there was a one paper in radiology where they looked at pneumonia versus infarcts and concluded that, in, that pneumonia you more commonly saw uh, saw air bronchograms. I don't actually think it's that important because I, I just think that this, you know, pneumonia just rarely gives you that rind of high attenuation and then just more uniform ground glass centrally. Right. You know, it's not a typical low bar pneumonia where you just have Travis, your sound is pretty bad. Uh, keeps breaking up all the time. So, um, yeah. Travis, do you want to try calling in on the phone? Your video seems to be okay. Can't hear you right now. Everything socked in. I think that's the biggest. Yeah. Travis, can you hear me? Yeah, I think we've lost. Yeah, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, you keep cutting out. Why don't do you want to try calling in with the phone? I can show a case or two while you do that, or I can just show some cases and cut swing back over to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Um, let, this is an interesting case. So this patient uh, recently um, transferred care to us. So he's in his early 50s and carries a diagnosis of respiratory papillomatosis, which he's had for years, of course. Um, and his um, he's been treated, um, I'm trying to remember what he was on. He was on an immunologic drug that seemed to keep his tracheal disease under under wraps. He'd had some um, lasering and stuff of the trachea, but he was on a clinical trial, um, and um, his tracheal disease had, in theory, stabilized. But I have a lot of serial imaging on him. He has had a squamous cell cancer for which he's had a, I believe it was a, I can't remember, it was a middle or an upper lobectomy. Um, but I want to show this just to show the evolution. So I'm going to go back for, um, several years ago. So um, first thing we see is there's thickening. I'll go to a bone window. Um, there's thickening and irregularity of the tracheal cartilage here, and you can see there's little frond-like projections on the lumen. I'll blow it up so you can see it a little bit better. And you can see these little papillomas along the way. And these have been, as I said, relatively stable. And, and like, as typical, it's very patchy. He also has occasionally, he has this little one here down at the tracheal carina. But what's, what's kind of cool is as we go into the lungs, I'll switch over the lung window here. Oops. There we go. You can see he's got some nodules and little cystic like or Cheerios. There's one right there. There's another one over here. And so these can form nodules. They can excavate out. These papillomas can grow in small airways and become little cysts or they often have a little wall to them. So in the differential for Cheerios, yeah, you can see he's had a lower lobectomy uh, and that was for a squamous cell, which is one of the complications of this is these papillomas can degenerate or and become squamous cells. Um, and so he's got all these nodules down here. This is actually the 2018 scan. I wanted to show you the 2014 scan. Yeah, there we go. So back in 2014, you can see he's got some rounded out electasis, um, but not much in the way of, of lung involvement at that time. So over and he's got a cyst here, but not a lot. And so just in the course of four years, he's developed a lot more disease in the lung. And the problem, of course, with these is what do you do with them? Um, you can't really resect all of them. Um, and when do you decide to go after it? So, for example, this nodule here, even if we compare it back to, um, let's see, you should see. so this will be 2017 over here on, on your, your right. You can see there's been quite a change 
see if I can get these fairly lined up, in the size of this, this nodule. So it's grown from this little guy to this big guy. And, you know, but there's multiple ones. So you can biopsy them and you, know, you have to decide, okay, are we going to be able to radiate it or, or ablate it? Um, is it a squame or is it just a papilloma growing rapidly? So it's kind of a tough question. We discussed this in our one of our oncology conferences and pretty much just have to come up with a plan of how frequently you're going to image these patients and what are your thresholds to intervene, you know, rapid growth. We don't, we, we'd like to have some more data to see how quickly this thing is growing. Um, but kind of set that up. And then when they develop central symptoms, you know, get a bronchoscopy and potential intervention to manage all of that. But it's, it's very rare in adults, especially of this age. It's most commonly a disease of adolescents and older children um, who get it usually from birth. And uh, the majority of the time it's above the glottis and they just get, and it's managed by the uh, you know, ENT surgeons. Um, but uh, in this case, it gets below into the trachea, so it becomes an interventional pulmonary and thoracic surgery issue. So, I, I, so findings that would make me worry about a squamous cell would be rapid growth of one of the, of one nodule, especially out of proportion to the other ones. Um, really, a, a cavitary lesion with ugly walls or very irregular spiculated margins, um, or new lymphadenopathy would be a little bit suspicious as well. I don't know if anyone else has any other insight. <clears throat> you know, I wonder, we, I wonder if anti-EGFR things would work on this kind of, you know, more indolent lung cancer or some, you know, T-cell therapy, some anti-PD-1 therapy would help reject Perhaps. these. You know, you think, that, you think that these work things should be really susceptible to the host immune status. Yes. I mean, and squames. I don't. I know EGFR won't work with squames really, but the, like you said, the PDL one may be a possibility, um, or some of this immune therapy um, and some of the other drugs they use to treat squamous cell. But a lot of times they're so slowly growing, it's hard to, um, you know, they don't necessarily respond well. And it's always a balance between toxicity and benefit. But yeah, this is it's a it's a very problematic disease, and I think most of the patients ultimately will succumb to a squamous cell cancer with time. Yeah, and we Jeff, can you hear me better now that I'm on the phone audio? That's better. Yeah, so we struggle too because the, those nodules enlarge and then they want biopsies to try and figure out if they're if they're just dysplastic squamous epithelium or if they're actually squamous cell carcinoma and I don't have a good answer. Yeah, I think just like like we decided or talked about in tumor board it's really getting a um, sort of a treatment plan in place with the patient based on their preferences and risk tolerance and things like that. Okay, and um, this is another cool case, something we don't see um, very often in older patients. So this is a, at the time, was a 40-year-old uh, patient, 40-year-old female patient with really bad pulmonary hypertension. And this was an outside CT done, and you can see that there's severe right ventricular hypertrophy, um, and, but not much in the way of chamber enlargement. And you can see the massively dilated pulmonary artery. And um, what's really cool is as we scroll up, you'll see there's this communication between the pulmonary artery and the descending aorta right at the level of the ductus arteriosus. And you can see along the edge, there's some calcification indicative of atherosclerosis. So this is a patent ductus arteriosus in an adult right there. And you can see a little bit of smoke there, Travis some white smoke. And uh, so this was treated percutaneously. And so this is the uh, angiographic run here. You can see this is the shunt. So there's the aortogram. There's a catheter in the pulmonary artery so they can measure pressure. And you can see this, there's the communication. And then I just have the post-procedural radiograph and they put in an amplatzer. So it looks like the, the dual flying, uh, you know, radio satellite or radio telescopes there. So they just did a, a block across it. In Seattle, those are two umbrellas. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So this is cool just because, you know, it's not something – we saw that AP or aorta pulmonary window the other week in an adult. Again, this you, these usually pre present in childhood or it's you know, early on because it's such a large shunt. And, you know, she does have a small descending aorta. Whoops, it's running like crazy. Um, you can see this the descending aorta is quite small for an adult. Um, and it's because most – you got, you got sort of – 
underfilling of the aorta because you're shunting into the pulmonary artery. All right, I'll show one more and then switch back to Travis, and then I've got some more if there's time. So this is a crazy case, and I'll show you it in the order that I came across it. So this was a you know a Tuesday morning after a long weekend. I'm looking at this uh, portable radiograph, and you know inpatient history is assessed or something non-specific doesn't really help me. And so I'm looking at my resident, and of course we noticed the port catheter. So I'm thinking cancer patient. There's effusions, and then there's this funny interface along the right paratracheal region with some gas in it. So I, without knowing anything, I thought maybe this was a post-op esophagectomy. This is the conduit here. You know, there's some junk in the bases, which we see effusions. I mean, it looks like a good look for that. Um, but, you know, it, there, I know there was no drain in, which is a little unusual. And then we pulled up the outside imaging. So um, I'm going to go back in time now. So this patient turns out when we dug into it, has a history of squamous cell carcinoma of the cervical esophagus. And this was um, just being treated with, it was treated with radiation and, and patients still receiving chemotherapy. So these are outside CTs, and what you'll notice, is, let's go to the top here, is so this is a few months ago, and you'll see already that there's this collection posterior to the esophagus. It's got some gas bubbles in it. It's got an enhancing wall and then a liquid component centrally, and then you can see the ugly, thickened esophagus. Uh, so looks like a contained rupture with um, a, an abscess associated with it. I think at this time, the patient had not had treatment based on what I could gather of the little, little bit of information that was provided to me at the time. But it looks like the patient already had an abscess in the upper mediastinum. I don't know if it was recognized as such. Um, I couldn't find any documentation of it. But the lower esophagus looks pretty good and all, all is there. So the patient is transferred to our institution and with a CT that looks like this. And I'll take you through it slowly. So there's this large collection here. And, you know, on first glance, you might wonder if this is a conduit and there's an anastomosis, but there is a communication between the esophageal lumen and this collection, which is well circumscribed, has a fluid level in it. And then as we scroll uh, inferiorly, you'll see there's the lumen of the esophagus and there's this collection, again, contained. And now we're down at the carina. There's the, you can make out barely faintly the esophageal mucosa enhancing. And there's this contained collection tracking way, way down. And then very subtle second communication down here. Except again, this patient has not had an esophagectomy. So what this is, is a gigantic and probably the largest mediastinal abscess I've ever seen. Um, now why it has a second communication, I don't know. There must have been some rip-roaring esophagitis um, not just from the tumor up top, but maybe from chemotherapy causing a mucositis, radiation. And so I think it's a uh, it's esophagomediastinal esophageal fistula. And then, and I'm, I think it's so well contained because it's sort of been percolating along for months as opposed to an acute rupture that just spilled out. Because I think at the time of diagnosis, there was already breakdown in this abscess right here. So this is where we were a few months ago. But unfortunately, I don't have a good radiograph that shows the full extent of it, but it's a quite striking mediastinal abscess. So they currently have been managing it very conservatively with um, antibiotics. Um, I, I'm sure they're going to have to put a stent across it um, or do something about it if they're going to do something. Um, not a surgical case, really. Uh, that tissue would be very, very bad. You'd have to do an esophagectomy and then exclude the cervical esophagus, which um, would not be ideal. Um, but that would be the only potential. And of course, you run a huge risk of post-operative infection because this if you rupture this thing into the pleural space or into the freely in the mediastinum, you could have a even a more rip-roaring infection. But I think because it's contained, they're trying to manage it conservatively. And I don't know what the plans are, but I suspect uh, if they can get it under control medically, they'll probably end up putting stents across to cover the defects. But you know, one of the known complications and one of the more common causes of a tracheoesophageal fistula, and in, well, in this case, an esophageal mediastinal fistula, but an esophageal breakdown in the chest of an adult is a, is a, is a, is a esophageal cancer, and then the treatment of it. Because um, if you have mostly tumor in the wall and the tumor dies from radiation and or chemotherapy, you end up with um, no real tissue to hold it together, and there's no serosa of the esophagus, so it just kind of spills out. Okay. Um, Travis, I'll switch back to you, and then I have a few more if there's time. Okay. Yeah, your audio connection is significantly better. Good. 
let's hope the video is still okay too. So I'm not sure how much of this case of the infarct you heard, but I'll just really quickly just reinforce that just this idea of this rind of higher attenuation, it looks like the, the rind of a, of a blood orange, as David would call it, and then the pulp in the center and just why this looks like an infarct and how it's confirmed. So this is the image I always use in another example, very similar to that. And so always thinking about infarcts in cases like this rather than pneumonia or something else. So, okay, this one just also came in yesterday and this patient, 61 year old man, and this is a non-contrast CT. And he had gone straight to the cath lab because he came in with chest pain, had ST elevation, had, was diagnosed with an MI, had a troponin of over 30. And in the cath lab, they were able to engage his left coronary artery, didn't find any disease, could not engage his right coronary artery. And so they suspected he might have something else going on. And I don't know if they saw it on the echo. I, I didn't read the echo report or not, but you can say this is, even though this is non-contrast, but there's still a little contrast from is still in his kidneys. So on the on the arterial, no surprise, you see that he has a dissection. And what's interesting about this case is you can see the hypoperfusion of the subendocardium in his LAD territory. And you can see how his LAD, how the entire anterior wall of the of the left ventricle looks hypoperfused, but it also looks a little dilated. So I think that it's already suffering from reduced systolic function. It's a little ballooned out there. And when you look, you can, the, the flap goes to the area of the left coronary. Can't really see the right coronary artery at all, although it looks like it's probably coming off of the false lumen right here. There's too much motion. And so this is a type A with coronary artery hypoperfusion as the presenting symptom. And then the other thing that's interesting, and I know, I think Seth and, and Howard have shown the best cases of this, but Uh, it looks like we lost Travis's audio again. Well, all right, let's see if it comes back. Uh, the coronary perfusion. And sometimes, I'm not sure why, sometimes we do delays. In this case, I think it's good because you can still see that there's a little bit of reduced perfusion and hypo-enhancement of the papillary muscles and the subendocardium of the left ventricle. But he did go to surgery, had a successful repair, and you'll see here how they described you know, that they thought it was a, they thought he was having an MI, took him to the cath lab, and then they, the surgeon commented on the concentric rupture of that ascending aorta. So I think it's always important to remember, you know, this case wasn't nearly as subtle as some of the ones that I think in particular Seth has shown where you get that intimo intimal interception. So whenever you lose the 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 intimal flap for any portion, look to see if it's gone somewhere else. And then they of course re they stabilize both of the coronaries. Did they describe in the op report that's really interesting, the relationship between the intimomedial flap in the aortic root and the origin of the coronary artery? I, I will look. I will look and see. Uh, I just I didn't have enough time. I was just putting it together. And clearly, it's it is near the the origins. And I don't yeah I don't know how it was affecting flow, but you can see a flap right there at the origin of the left corner. I see it now. That so, particular right there. It's yeah, pretty close. And yeah. maybe partly obstructing it it's, and so on. So right, dynamically obstructing yeah. it. That so, is interesting. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. That's so, okay, I'll, I will show one more. This is kind of interesting because this is a, it's an older case, but I, I think it's a pretty instructive case. This is a young man. He's 49 back when he had this done. And five years prior to this, he had presented with some new skin rash and was presumptively diagnosed with discoid lupus at the time, was okay for a while, then had some cough that went on for a while and was, you know, led to a radiograph and led to a CT. And as you can see here, he's got just innumerable nodules. And this is kind of interesting, I think, because A, there's not really that much of, an, of a craniocardial 
craniocaudal gradient. Maybe you can argue there's a little bit more in the upper lobe, and maybe you can argue there's a little bit of clustering along the along the fissures and along the the pleural surfaces. He also has typical lymphadenopathy, and this is one of the this is probably the best example I've seen. I think where you could argue that sarcoid has a miliary distribution because I'm I, I still think it's argue it's still a little bit more perilymphatic because there's some areas that are spaced out. I've always, I know I've shown cases, I'm, I, I'm not necessarily a believer in sarcoid causing a true miliary pattern because I think it's more like this, but show this because I think this is the, the closest example I've seen. But I think even in these cases, you can still see that, that there are areas where be clustered along the lymphatic and some areas that are relatively spared. So I don't know. What do you, yeah, what do you, I agree. Everyone else is... Uh, um, the, the, what also is really nice is if you look at a couple of images, you had some beautiful, like right there, the bronchovascular bundles are so nodular. Yeah. It just, that just screams perilymphatic. But I agree with you. Um, yeah, I think the miliary pattern refers more to the just the numerous small nodules. Right. Not necessarily a, a random. There's the some distribution. Other, yeah. I mean, that's why it gets confusing because people talk about sometimes use miliary and random, but you can have random metastases that aren't miliary because they're five, four millimeters six millimeters true but uh, yeah that's yeah a i guess case. yeah yeah i guess i would argue yeah i always think of miliary as tiny nodules in a random distribution whereas you're right you can have random or hematogenous metastases that are larger in a random distribution but not miliary but yeah i don't so yeah i'm still anti describing sarcoid as miliary and i think your observation is correct even because even along some of the pulmonary veins, they're studded. Like, I think that's a vein right there. And it's just got, and right there, mm -hmm. there's just tons of nodules along those. And look at that so, bronchus, that posterior segmental bronchus in the right upper lobe. You can just follow the nodules right along it. But you were just, yeah. yeah. That's a great Yeah. Case. Yeah, I, I wanted to pull this one up because it was somehow this guy resurfaced in our ILD program. And I just thought that this was a good teaching case for innumerable micronodules in a perilymphatic distribution. Yep. yep. So, very okay. nice. Okay, I'll stop there and, and let you show some more, Jeff. Okay. All right, let's see what I wanted to show here. Um, no, okay, because I like this disease, I'll show another example. So this is a um, kidney transplant recipient who came in with a uh, cough and fever and you can see there's consolidation in the right lung and the outside radiograph is back laterals backwards but you can see it's a pretty extensive area of consolidation here um he wasn't getting better with standard treatment so you know he's immune suppressed so they watch these people very carefully so the ct is about three weeks later and um it's got let's change the window here um you still have this very extensive consolidation in the right lung um, a lot of volume loss there, but what's unusual in this case is you now you now have got some pleural effusion, but not 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 striking, um, and there's a little bit of lymph node enlargement, but not a lot. Notice the azygous vein is really large too, um, and this is another example of blastomycosis. And it turns out this guy lives out in the country, um, near the forest part of Wisconsin, not the prairie, end, and loves to walk in the woods a lot. So you know we've had a one of the, the probably the wettest summer on in history, we've had flooding, we've had a lot of rain, so the soil has been extremely moist. Uh, there's been a lot of disruption of the soil with flooding and down trees and stuff, so perfect place for blasto to grow. And so this is a, a case of blastomycosis. And now what would make you think of blasto in a, on things I always talk about is uh, usually very extensive consolidation, really striking lack of pleural effusion. Um, he just doesn't, he has a small effusion, but they don't you don't typically get the effusions and empyema as you see with uh, bacterial infections. He does have necrotic tissue. And then the lymphadenopathy is not really overwhelming. It's just reactive looking nodes, not, not the big fat juicy nodes you see with some other infections. So another case of pulmonary blastomycosis and um, affects immune competent and immune compromised patients. Um, now this is a case, I'm curious how you guys would, would, would handle this because I was kind of shocked when I ultimately got the pathology. So this was a patient who had a cough um, and had this sort of curvilinear focus on uh, her chest radiograph. And uh, on the lateral, you'll see that, it, I'll blow it up for everyone, but it 
It's located sort of in the superior segment of the lower lobe on the on the left. And it's got this sort of branching pattern, but fairly straight um, margins. And, you know, I think if I had seen this on an initial one, I, I probably would have called it some atelectasis or scar. There's a little distortion around it. Um, and this is where having an old one would be helpful if it had been there. Um, so here's the CT. And when you first look at it, um, so we scroll down, we'll see, you know, there, there it is. It's got very sharp margins. It seems to be associated with the, near the fissure. It's got dilated and distorted airways, so it looks like some traction bronchiectasis, but very sharp margins, although there's a little bit of sort of little lines coming out of it, and again, that airway distortion. Now I'll show you the coronals, um, because the morphology is, I think, very misleading in this. So you can see it's very, it, it does pull down the fissure, but it's very linear, curvilinear, almost flat, you know, maybe like old TB or something. Yeah. I mean, is that what you guys would think? It almost looks like radi yeah, it almost looks like old radiation. Right. It's got such sharp margins. But so this persisted over a couple of studies, and um, so if someone got a PET scan. Um, you know, we typically don't pet do pets for nodules because we have so much endemic fungus. I'm not a big fan of it. But somewhere else, they decide a PET scan would be something to do. And you can see this thing has quite a bit of activity in it. I'm sorry, I had to turn off the sound. Oh, so on. On the Pelker case? Yeah. So I reviewed this case long ago in 2017, and I haven't been sent any subsequent imaging recently. Um, I muted David. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was a, I think he was talking to somebody on the phone. Yeah. I, okay. Thanks. That didn't make sense. We're just having audio fun today. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So that they so because of that, they did a transbronchial biopsy, and this is adenocarcinoma of the lung. And so, you know, when I I came across this case because I was reading a post-op CT, and I went back because I always like to look and see what cancers look like when we started, and I was kind of shocked. Um, I don't think that would have been my first choice. Now, in retrospect, does it have features of adenocarcinoma? Absolutely. It has distorted airways. It has distortion of the fissure. It, um, you know, it um, doesn't have any of the cystic spaces, but it does have some some subtle speculation in a few on a few images, such as this image here. But I don't think that would have been my first choice. And from the radiograph, I wouldn't have even considered cancer. I agree absolutely. I think it's just one of those situations where you have a very unusual manifestation of something bad. Because I would have done exactly the same thing, said yeah. adelectrical scarring without hesitation. Yeah. I, and I guess do so again, probably yeah. again in the yeah, future. Yeah, because when you showed the pet, yeah, when you showed the pet, it was only that lateral portion that looked a little bit more like soft tissue and a little bit more lobulated that had right metabolic activity i'm curious if they do a low back to me how much of this is actually cancer and how much of it is just scar yeah. well i guess there's even some immediately actually, there too it's have, like i don't have the path report but i reviewed it and it was majority yeah. invasive adenocarcinoma um and it was the uh oh i can't remember type but there was only a small amount of lipidic growth and it was a big cancer they called it like a god like a t2 yeah, you almost wonder if, if it caused some sort of desmoplastic reaction and caused no, the lung no to doubt. scar there. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, geez, that's scary. And you wonder if maybe its location along the fissure had some play in the geometry of it. it sort of act because you can see it pulls it down, which gives you it keeps that margin clean. And you wonder had there, you know, and instead of instead of pushing on it, it managed to pull it down. But yeah, this is one yeah, this one gave me a lot of pause because I have not seen something like this and <laughs> <laughs> have to can't call every scar a cancer but you know this Agreed. one you know on the radiograph this is just i don't know i, I have a really i struggle really hard with that okay well it is uh, time guys thank you very much and um we will continue again next week and hopefully we will not have our audio issues yeah hopefully sorry get the audio better okay talk to you later take care guys bye bye